since millions of us sat mesmerized in front of our TV sets watching history being made, Americans everywhere were witnessing the intrigue of the Iran-Contra hearings. A parade of top government officials and foreign millionaires all made headlines, but it was a 28-year-old secretary who really captured America's attention. Her poise, beauty, and sense of humor literally tripled the viewing audience. As a secretary, it was my job to facilitate the smooth operation of the office. I was a dedicated and a loyal secretary and performed my duties in an exemplary manner. I can type. <laughs> All this week she'll be demonstrating she can do a lot more than type as she joins me as my special guest host and correspondent. Please welcome Miss Vaughn Hall. <laughs> well, it's nice to have you with us. Thank you. It. It's great to be here. Good. There is no question that uh, you made headlines in 1987, and I'm sure a lot has changed in your life. For the better, I hope. Yes. M most of the changes. There's been a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, most of them positive. Um, when so many things are thrown at you, you, you begin to ask yourself a lot of questions. So in so a certain sense, you begin to know a lot more about yourself. You, you dig a little deeper to find out what you're capable of doing. And as a secretary um, for 12 years, I started when I was 16 at the Department of the Navy. I always knew, especially in the latter years working at the NSC, that I could, there was a chance I could do more. I knew I could do more than I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I was so happy in my, my, in my job as a secretary. I really didn't push myself because I was happy. But there was that struggle inside that I knew I could do more. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, you know, I think a secretary's job, you can... You can make it whatever, anybody can make a job whatever it is. Um, you know, I once had a guy say to me, you know, I want a secretary that doesn't want my job. And <laughs> so, I mean, I was happy, but I've, since last November, I've done speaking engagements. And to think, in fact, in my first speech before the New York State Broadcasters Association, I said, you know, if someone had told me a year ago that I would be up here speaking before 250 people, I would have told them they just had a very bad nightmare, <laughs> you know, that there's like no way I could do that. And I'm out there doing it and I feel really good about it. Now, after the uh, Iran-Contra hearings, uh, I guess offers just poured in for you. Everything from television shows to posing for Penthouse for a reported, am I correct here, a half a million dollars? Um, I believe that's what it was. Holy I, smokes. I, it was something I wouldn't even consider. To doing fashion layouts and so forth. Now, you don't have the experience or the background to sort of sift through all of these offers. Where do you go for help? Well, you, uh, it was a very hard decision. Um, ever since the day that I stepped out on Plato Kacharis' steps in front of my lawyer's office, mm -hmm. um, offers started swarming in from all different kinds of agencies to photographers and everything. And I went with William Morris because I asked a lot of people, you know, friends and, and people I respected their opinions and values. And I chose William Morris because they had a very good reputation and my parents, they even said to me, you know, I started, even after I signed, I started feeling really kind of bad about it because I felt, um, it's like the opportunity came so quickly. I've always been used to working things all my life, for, working for everything and working hard for them. And this came so quickly that it, I almost felt guilty about all the opportunities that had well, opened up. But my parents said, look, don't feel guilty about that. Everyone gets opportunities in life and just... Go with it well, and do something of, positive for yourself. Don't you think a lot of people have capitalized on that, as Andy Warhol said, 15 minutes of fame? Mm -hmm. And as many people have written, they get lost on the path to stardom without a great deal of thought. Many people have written that the one report I remember wrote that you had, you had resisted that sort of tasteless impatience that, that happens to so many people, by, and they go ahead and do things that they regret for the rest of their life. That's one thing I've learned. That's one thing I try to stress in my speeches, too, that don't go for the, don't, everything in America now is like quick. Mm -hmm. You know, go for the short term. I'm saying think about things because in the end, if you do what you really feel is right, it will, you know, it will work out. And I, you know, I, I wanted to go into broadcasting and there was, that was the only thing I really felt that was really Where me. did that interest turn? A lot of people called me up after the hearings and they said, would you ever consider doing broadcasting or anchoring? I thought, it just clicked. I said, that would be... You had that... never thought of that before? Never thought of it before. Never thought of it. Well, we are thrilled to death to have you this week, but Thank you. how did we get selected? Well, I've always, you know, I've always liked your style. I think that you're easygoing and you ask good questions. And you're just... Careful, a, you're, you can, you no, can be voted on. the dullest woman uh, of 88. No, no. I mean, you just have... I a, did. You... I got that award. 
Mr. Dull. I no, don't know. It's an honor, I, though. It's I, sort of like being on the worst dress list, I suppose. No, you have, you have a really warm personality. I think that people can relate to you really well. That's why I chose our magazine. Listen, all this happened. Uh, you were still living at home. How did your parents react to this wild, crazy period in your life? They were very, very supportive. I realized just how much my parents loved me and just how lucky I am to have parents like them. Um, I remember the first night, uh, I think it was Johnny Carson mentioned my name on TV. My dad just, we just kind of went, oh my, it's, it's wild to hear your name mm -hmm. on something like that. And it, there are different periods, that different things happen, and you just kind of suddenly realize that you're no longer just Vaughn Hall. It's t this, this name has taken on a, a, you know, an entity in itself. And they've been very supportive of, you know, the decisions I've made, and they've helped me when, um, when things have happened and I've been upset, they've said, look, you know, they've kind of put me back in perspective and said, you know, you know, you are the one that, you know, you can make your own decisions. Just look inside. And, and they've been very supportive. Very. Now, when you uh, appeared before the uh, committee in the Iran-Contra hearings, you testified with a grant of immunity. So we can't <clears throat> really go back and talk about any of that. I just did, I wanted to get your feeling because I know how devoted you were and still are to Oliver North, your former boss. Are you a little surprised or perhaps... I don't know, dismayed, that there seems to be a shift in sentiment uh, toward Colonel North since last summer? First of all, I don't believe there has been a shift in sentiment towards him. Um, I think that the problem that why people might say that is because he's not been out in the public eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been with his lawyers, you know, working on, on the, you know, the upcoming trial, perhaps it might, might happen. And... Um, He's not been out in the public eye. I mean, people haven't seen him. So, I mean, if you don't see him, there's nothing to talk about. But I still have friends that tell me, hey, I was in Dallas, Fort Worth, and I saw an Ollie t-shirt, you know. I think the public, I, even during out, going out in my, during my speeches, people, I almost, I get so emotional because the people are really behind him. I mean, I, I feel that when I go out and give my speeches because I talk about Iran-Contra from my perspective. There's still a lot and of I, support out there? Yes. I believe so. Overwhelming. I, I know you're still with the Navy Department. You're what, in the typing pool now? A typing pool? No, I'm a secretary. Well, I'm well, a secretary. I don't know. There's, a, there's, there's what do they, I mean, what do they do? Do they just assign you to some place, or do you have a permanent uh, office at the moment? In January, I was transferred back to the Department of the Navy. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I had worked for the Department of the Navy before I went to NSC, so it was a logical move back. Yeah, so you're, you're on vacation now. Yes. Well, we're awfully thrilled that you decided to spend it with us. We Thank should have you. some fun. Yes, we're going to have I lots of fun. I think the first thing we should do is uh, sort of tell the audience what's on the show today. Why don't you start? Okay. Well, Gary, millions of viewers were moved when Marley Matlin spoke her first words at this year's Oscars. We'll meet the woman who taught Marley and discover how she can help anyone speak more effectively. We'll tell you why an increasing number of young adults continue to live at home. Two years ago, model Marla Hansen was brutally attacked, scarring her for life. We'll learn how she's now helping other people with skin problems. All this and more in today's edition. That's Monday's edition of Our Magazine. When we come back. I'm very happy. Kind of comfortable, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's kind of comfortable. Okay, well, the trend seems to indicate that she's not alone. Dr. Beverly Feldman, author of Kids Who Succeed, is here to explain the reasons behind this trend. Also joining us are Karen Leslie, a 27-year-old woman who chose to move home, and her mom, Beverly Matthews. And the jury is still out, I suppose, with, with <laughs> Beverly. Uh, first of all, Dr. Feldman, a couple of the statistics that we saw coming into this spot uh, really kind of surprised me. What is it, 60 or over 60 percent of the kids? 65 percent of all single-grown children, ages 20 to 30, are either remain, in the, remain at home or return to the nest. Why is that? Well, you've got three problems. The kids are floundering today, Gary, because, and Fawn, uh, because, first of all, you've got an economy that's out of cash. Mm -hmm. Kids can't afford to, uh, to set up their independence uh, on a beginner's salary. That's if they start at the bottom. And then you have uh, an economy that is uh, an inflation, right? So we, you have an educational system that's out of sync. Uh, you, as a college teacher, I can certainly tell you that we graduate kids who are 10 years behind the needs of the workplace. And they don't, get enough about, they don't know enough about career choices. And but, the third is with parenting. Parenting is really out of date. It's suited for another time, another economy. And that's well, what we well, have wait to... Wait a minute, Dr. Yeah. How does this affect whether or not a kid comes back home? I mean, the ability of a parent to parent. Oh, you bet. How so? A parent can teach a child 
Oh, independence? Oh, you bet. Oh, okay. It can instill independence, the desire for independence in a child. And uh, that's one thing that parents aren't doing today. All right. Was yours, was yours economic, um, basically? It was, because I was, um, I, was, I was working a lot of hours, and I was kind of forced to move out of the place I was living with, um, with my sister because there was a problem with the apartment. And when I went to go hunt for a new apartment, I soon found out that there were $700, $900, and I wasn't even spending any of my time there. Mm -hmm. And the carpet was like yellow shag or something, you know, something I couldn't deal with. <laughs> and so I, I said, why, how can I invest all this money and I don't even be using the place? So I moved home three months and it turned into four years. Yeah. Karen, mm -hmm. your reason for moving home? Financially, definitely. Now you're a floral designer? Yes, I had to start my own business. of a martini they do their good deeds we love them this is betty and this is alma and they're two beautiful dogs and we salute them both and thank you for being with us this morning and what a great moment to be here calling zurich home the swiss refer to it as the city by the lake it's the second stop on our tour through europe aboard the orient express we're up in the alps today tuesday may the 10th 1988 from NBC News, this is Today on the Orient Express with Frank Gumbel and Jane Pauley, live from Zurich, Switzerland. Shortly after we signed off in Paris, we loaded our gear and ourselves onto the legendary Orient Express, pulled out of Gare du Nord train station and headed southeast. Now several hours, two borders, and 550 miles of train track later, we're on the shores of Lake Zurich, set for day two of our European adventure. And good morning. Welcome to today on a Tuesday morning, and welcome to Switzerland, where we have drawn not the loveliest of days, but certainly among the loveliest of settings, yes? They, absolutely. We have swans to the back. We have the Alps over there, but you have to use your imagination. How'd you sleep last night aboard your first night on the Orient Express? Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't fall off the bed like three, like, uh, three <laughs> times like Alice and Davis did. That's right. Willard didn't get lots <laughs> of sleep. We'll, we'll talk about our adventure as it goes along. Let's get back to the setting. Pretty as this is, when you think of Switzerland, you think of more than mountains and meadows you think of money, international finance, tons of gold. It's here. It's in the vaults of those famous Swiss banks guarded off times by those secret Swiss bank accounts. We'll get into the legal and moral ethics of those accounts in just about eight minutes. Jay? Whenever there is a disaster in the world, chances are a Swiss rescue team is en route. Now, we anticipate no disasters today, but we are grateful that the Swiss Air Rescue is nearby. We'll talk to them. We'll also look at the second largest privately owned art collection in the world. We'll talk to Swiss actress Marta Keller. We'll introduce you to the Kenny family. Seven Trudges up rugged slopes four times a week if the weather is good. Sometimes with clients in tow, or as on this day, with a young guide in training. Just in front, that's just uh, Gima Diazzi. Then the impish horn, the first one, you know that. That's the Matterhorn, huh? Matterhorn, yeah. Six years ago, Ulrich stopped climbing the Matterhorn because he doesn't want his clients to take any risks. But even now, this octogenarian is not usually the one who needs to rest. If it's necessary, then I stop. But I, I like to go very long. If the, the people behind on the rope, he makes... <coughs> then then I know it's time to stop. Some American people, the young men, they come once, one day, the next day, the matter on. It's not good. Huh? What is good is Ulrich's reputation. He gets high praise from the president of Zermatt's Association of Mountain Guides, Otmar Kronig. He's uh, our superstar. <laughs> and he's also a symbol of the guides, you know, and the life of guides. And uh, we all have great respect for him that he can still do so well at his age. Even the villagers who aren't experts on alpine guiding are fans. I think he's amazing. 88 year old and as active as he is still. It's really astonishing. He's a very famous young sermon, I think, yes. And he likes to tell old stories of his life when he was young. And if he begins to, to talk, there are, yes, in a few minutes, a lot of people around him. Who... He has his only life, his nature and God, I think. That's what makes him going to the mountains every day. And he's in a good shape, huh? Ulrich says he has no secret formula for staying in such good shape at his age, but Otmar Kronig thinks he knows how he does it. He doesn't smoke and not too much drinking and so 
Not too many women. He says. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> he lives a very reasonable life, and he never went fast in the mountain, you know. He has a very good rhythm, and I think that's uh, one of the secrets. Never going fast or slow, but the way he starts, he can go on for eight hours or so. Sometimes people think if they don't know him, he might not be fit or strong enough to hold him. But uh, I myself would, without any question, any time go on his rope. Perhaps Ulrich's longevity is due to his simple way of life, a way of life that has changed little over the years. And this here is my last prize from the ski run. I'm always the first and the last in my class. There are never any other competitors in the category for 84 to 88 year old ski racers. For the 20 past years, uh, he hasn't changed much, you know. Since I know him, he's always been a bit the same. Maybe slowing down a little, but it looks like he will last forever. And all Zurich, Switzerland. We'll be back after a message. The Federal Republic of Germany, a European giant of enormous natural riches. We're in the Bavarian capital of Munich, an historic city within a hundred miles of the Austrian-Italian border. Its location and vibrancy has made Munich a meeting place of northern and southern Europe for centuries. It's the midpoint of our week aboard the Orient Express, home base for our ongoing European adventure today, Wednesday, May the 11th, 1988. From NBC News, this is Today on the Orient Express with Bryant Gumbel and Jane Pauley. Live from Munich, West Germany. Never mind as the crow flies. As the train rides, Munich lies northeast of Zurich. Our Orient Express logged 500 overnight miles to get from there to here. And though we pulled in under cover of darkness, that darkness has given way to a gorgeous day in the German Alps of Bavaria. Perhaps I might add the nicest day we have encountered on our European adventure. And good morning. Welcome to today on this Wednesday morning. Lovely here, isn't it? Huh? This is a lovely town, Starnberg. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is our Orient Express right behind us, by the way. That's That actually is is the dining car. Mm -hmm. Some of the guys up there working right now. How we'll you enjoying... spend some time in the dining car. How are you enjoying the food, by the way? Uh, well, very much, though it's a little distracting when you look out the window and... There are the Alps again. I know. Darn. Such beautiful scenery. Also, we slept much better. We'll talk about that as the day goes on. Let's talk about Munich a little bit. This city is uh, third in size uh, among German cities. It ranks right uh, below Berlin and, and Hamburg. But uh, it may rank third in size, but we are told it ranks first in the hearts of the people. According to polls taken, this is the place most Germans would vote for if they had the chance to live elsewhere. In these parts, it's considered a fun city, and we'll begin to check out that reputation in just about eight minutes. Jane? We're also going to 
to learn how German beer got to be so good. Well, they did have to learn how to do it. You can get a college degree in brewing in Germany. We'll meet some of the people who make their living on the River Rhine and who also live on the River Rhine. We'll show you the most spectacular castle in Germany, and there are 6,000 of them. This one is called Berg Elz, and to the German count who lives there, it's just home. Hmm. With Germany marking the point of confrontation between East and West, we'll talk of summits and missiles with our ambassador here, Richard Burt, and we'll also visit the Munich headquarters of Radio Free Europe. All that and much more to come. Let's start our Wednesday morning back at the news desk, Studio 3B in New York, with a good morning to John Palmer. John? Very good. So that's a feather. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what is it? So what kind of a... It's a... It's not a stag tail, is it? Uh, I don't know. What is this called? Anybody know? I don't know. We're sure to find out before we get off here. I've been to Munich already. I went downtown and had Did coffee. Did you really? What a clean, beautiful town. And the t at the town hall, they have the, the, in this Bavarian city, famous for its... Uh, what they're, they're discussing it over there now. No. What's it called? It's a Tyrol hat. It's a Tyrol well, hat. We knew it was a Tyrol yeah. hat. Yeah. Tyrolian hat. Tyrolian hat. What is the funny thing hanging down? It's a bush. It's a bush. There's some oh. funny thing hanging oh. down. That's right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the chimes, you know, in the little uh, town uh -huh. hall, and then the little figures come out and do their little thing. It really is neat town. Leuvenbroi. This is the home of the Leuvenbroi Pier. You've got a pig over there. I noticed that. Yes. All sorts of good things. You know, you mentioned Irving Berlin. Got to get in on that act. A hundred years old. Carnegie Hall. Beautiful concert in his honor tonight. And the American Red Cross, not the American, but the Red Cross, International Red Cross, was founded in Switzerland, and they are celebrating their 125th birthday. We missed that yesterday. Let's check the weather act this morning and see exactly what we have. It is a beautiful day. It's about 65 degrees this morning. A gentle breeze is blowing, but the sun is out. We couldn't ask for better. Record heat in the United States in the southwest. It's 100 years old today. She goes to church every Sunday. She's a Red Sox fan, and she is 100. Happy birthday. <laughs> More to come along, and I'm going to try to get into my pants in just a few minutes, if I can. Thank you, Dr. Scott. On close-up this morning, we take a look at Munich. As Willard just noted, it is overflowing with museums, theaters, beer gardens, parks, great restaurants. As we noted earlier, it's the place where 60% of West Germans have said they would live if they could. So we decided to take a look at the city that has been called the secret capital of Germany. secret capital of Germany because um, most of German people want to live here. Munich is not a big town like, like London or Paris. It's like a very small village. A lot of rich people choose to live in Munich even if they have their business somewhere else because it's a sophisticated and beautiful city. Each city in the country has changed considerably after the last world war not just because of the bombing that left so many spaces to be rebuilt but um, Munich looks different by looking exactly the way it looked before if you look around in the city it's wonderful scenery wonderful buildings wonderful churches wonderful art collections, there are three opera houses, there are at least 40 theaters, there are innumerable musical activities. It's hard to, to get down to work because the distractions are uh, so many. Munich people like to make a party. They try to do it everywhere. Every day you have a little, a little party here in this town. In Germany, all over Germany, they call Munich Schickimicki. I don't know why, but it is so. Like, uh, you, you heard about it, uh, they go to a party and they go kiss and kiss, and uh, this is Munich. And this is Schickimicki. <laughs> We have a special uh, feeling of uh, freedom here in, in Munich. You know, in Berlin there is a big wall around, but here you can sit on Friday evening and say, well, tomorrow it could be nice weather. What shall we do? We can do inside Munich, English garden, you can walking and so on, you can make shopping and so on. You can do outside in the near, 
and the lakes and the mountains and the forests and golf courses and so on. And you can uh, go to Italy or Austria and uh, <laughs> Czechoslovakia. It's, it's not so far away. 100, 150, 200 kilometers, you do it easy. So you have a lot of possibilities to choose what you, what you will do in your leisure time. It's 13 minutes past the hour now. In just a moment, Jane's going to introduce us to the American voice behind the Iron Curtain. The voice